welcome to this uh, uh, medical classes grand round on primary amenorrhea and this is going to be a very interactive and interesting webinar in which we'll talk about four very interesting cases of girls who presented with amenorrhea and where we found to have a lot of issues in terms of assessment and diagnosis we are really happy to have two of our colleagues who have joined from across the country dr sekhar is there who is a practicing endocrinologist uh, at rajmundri and he is working in the medical college dr sekhar welcome uh, on board and good afternoon, uh, good afternoon and he'll be presenting about a very very interesting case then we have got dr guru prasad who is uh, part of the medical classes course and program as well and he is practicing as an endocrinologist at uh, bangalore dr guru prasad uh, welcome to the program yes so uh, we'll start off a bit with regards to the initial aspects of what is the common causes of primary amenorrhea particularly with the angle of what we are discussing today about tall girls with amenorrhea then we will use those four cases to see how these practical assessment tips will help out and all of these cases have quite unique issues which are there in terms of diagnosis and management which we'll be covering from that perspective so we'll start off first of all as to why it is important to evaluate for amenorrhea and what can be significant implications which can happen in that perspective so uh, i hope the slide is visible now so this is a 17 year old girl with primary amenorrhea who presented to us with stage 4 breast development and also at pubic hole development and there was no menstrual cycle so there was a normal development otherwise but there was no periods basically she was a tall girl now this is a common concept which we'll talk about all the four individuals we'll talk today were those who were either tall or had the potential to be tall in that their bone ages were open and they had a delayed bone age in that perspective it was found that the fsh level was high lh was high and estradiol was low so our diagnosis was established basically of a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and started on routine replacement therapy now what happened on follow up was a bit uh, uh depressing that the child actually developed a gonadoblastoma and that was because a proper karyotype assessment was not done and when we checked the karyotype it was actually a xy phenotype so it gives a big message that even if we have a classical feature of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism we should look at karyotype we have said that even if you have a child who looks entirely like turner syndrome even then karyotype is important because you may have a y cell line but if somebody is tall then of course you want to talk about situation where you need to be very very cautious in terms of assessment so the theme today is about primary amenorrhea particularly because of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and tall individuals so this basically brings us to a very narrow group but a very important group of individuals who present to us with implications now if we talk about primary amenorrhea it's there around 2.5% of cases most of them would be physiological or functional in that perspective but still there would be a significant number of pathology which we need to evaluate therefore there is a need for meticulous evaluation in that perspective you all can go and have a look at our website learning.grossociety.in where there are a lot of resources about pediatric endocrinology are available many of our courses are available in the form of fellowship and diploma programs especially also for gynecologists as well as adolescent physicians we routinely run three programs of pg lecture series and two grand rounds for the pediatric endocrinologist as well as pediatricians and we have got publications which can be accessed both online as well as the hard copy and our mobile application which helps making diagnosis very easy in that perspective so the agenda for today is that we'll talk about four specific cases in a scenario where we have a girl who has amenorrhea with high estrogen the second would be low estrogen and high androgen a interesting case scenario the third would be the issues with regards to whether there's a problem in the structure or the function and then finally whether the gonad or the enzyme is defective so these are four very interesting cases all have common of having primary amenorrhea in a relatively tall girl with hypergonadotropic hypogonadism so before we go that we need to just have a touch base about pathophysiology of uh, uh, primary amenorrhea so in that regards we all know that there are four organs which are going to play a role the hypothalamus pituitary as a unit the ovaries and the uterus so all of them have to work in tandem to ensure that the periods happen so we know that gnrh is a primary regulator of the gonadotrophins which then synergistically add on the ovary so lh acts on the lh receptor on theca cells to produce androstenedione while fsh acts on the, uh, the follicular the granulosa cell largely to produce aromatase to produce estradiol 
Now, both of them are synergistically required. What's important to understand is that in boys, LH is more important as compared to FSH. In girls, FSH is more important than LH. So abnormalities, isolated abnormalities in FSH or FSH receptor will cause a complete delayed puberty, no development and primary amenorrhea because you will have nothing, no follicle, nothing will develop. But abnormalities in the LH pathway, isolated LH defects, or if you have a LH resistance, will not cause primary amenorrhea. They will produce more like anovulatory feedings, findings in that perspective. If you put in the opposite perspective in boys, if you talk about abnormalities which are there with regards to the LH, you will have no pubertal development. So LHCG receptor defect, as we talk about present to us with atypical genitalia, so very, very early and severe defect. FSH abnormalities will not have that much problem. You may actually have a high level of androgens, but the spermatogenesis may be defective. So just to put things in perspective, if you have abnormality in FSH, isolated abnormalities, you will have significant delayed puberty and primary amenorrhea. LH abnormalities may not cause that. Of course, GnRH and those problems will cause primary amenorrhea and delayed puberty. We'll not focus that much on those groups today. Now, this estradiol is then converted uh, via from androstenedione via aromatase. So, if you have an aromatase defect, you will have a sort of a situation in which androgens are high and estrogen are low. So, the presentation in that scenario will typically be a child who has got some virilization at birth. Atypical genitalia will be there. The mother will also give you a history of hirsutism or virilization during pregnancy. And then things remain silent and then later on they will present with estrogen deficiency in the form of delayed bone age and primary amenorrhea with delayed pubertal development. Of course, estradiol has to work on the estrogen receptor and if there are estrogen receptor problem, you will again have problems which are associated with isolated abnormalities with regards. So if you have no estrogen action, the child will be born with a normal genitalia. Because the default mode of development is a normal female. So zero estrogen, zero estrogen action, normal female development will happen. Subsequent to that, the presentation will be delayed puberty, no breast development. And you will also have a problem in terms of amenorrhea. Now remember, because androgens are acting here. So your adrenal androgens are active. So therefore, you will have a pubarchy, which will happen in this scenario. So what I'm trying to do is to link up all this pathophysiology to clinical pointers, which will help us reach a diagnosis in that perspective. Again, because estrogen is the major regulator of epiphyseal fusion, you will have a delayed bone age in that perspective. Of course, if you have a problem in the development of the uterus, particularly in the Mullerian structure, the upper two thirds of the uterine, the vagina and the uterine development, you will have amenorrhea. These individuals will have normal breast development normal pubic hair development, and they will have amenorrhea. So if you want to just assess clinically a girl who presents you with primary amenorrhea, you have to look at three major things. What is the height? What is the breast development? What is the pubic hair development? And our algorithm will largely base upon this in that perspective. So abnormalities in the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, that will be classical delayed puberty, of course, you will have no development in that perspective. You may have pubarchy in this scenario because adrenal production is there. However, if you have a multiple predatory hormone deficiency, you will also not have pubarchy. So pubic hair development is very important. Ovarian abnormalities like gonadal dysgenesis, the classical example being Turner syndrome with short stature, but many of the XYDSD. So as discussed, XYDSD is basically an act of omission, while XXDSD is an act of commission. So something extra has to be done. So XYDSD, any of the genes which are defective, they do not develop into testis. You will have a normal female development, which will happen. This will be associated with tall stature. As discussed, if you have a receptor problem, particularly the FSH receptor problem, you will have much more problems in terms of pubertal development. Abnormalities in aromatase will cause atypical genitalia at birth, followed by primary amenorrhea subsequently. If you have problem in the estrogen receptor, you will have pretty much a child who is a tall individual who has got reasonably high or an inappropriately normal level of estradiol. 
and then of course you have the structural defect so primary amenorrhea can be because of a structural defect like a mullerian abnormality or rarely imperforate hymen you know that is something which is easy to identify but often missed so if you have a young girl who presents to you with acute abdomen abdominal pain and you find a abdominal lump look at the breast development and ask whether there is a bleeding which has happened earlier or not so this is a cryptomenorrhea a easy diagnosis to make but it is often missed otherwise structural defects will have a normal breast development and a normal pubic hair development then if you have a functional defect that's mean that you don't have a production of estrogen you typically you have either too little estrogen or too much androgen so if there is androgen excess also you can have primary amenorrhea and this can happen in the setting of pcos and ch and you will have hirsutism then if you have a impaired estrogen effect where you will have no thylarchy because there is no estrogen in that perspective this can be because of resistance which is estrogen receptor defect where your estrogen levels will be relatively high or you have a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism central cause or you have a high fsh which is a hypergonadotropic hypergonadism high fsh can be because of a xx dst or a xy dst remember xy dst can also have a similar manifestation if the testis is not developed it's damaged it's vanished you may have a complete female appearance in that scenario the characteristic feature here will be tall stature so as i said tall stature means you may have xy dsd as i discussed about the first case in that scenario an interesting scenario is complete androgen insensitivity syndrome which may also present to you with a girl with primary amenorrhea who has got good breast development but sparse pubic hair so again breast and pubic hair will give you the diagnosis in most scenario and finally you can have a biosynthetic defect so if there is a proximal biosynthetic defect like star or side chain cleavage you may rarely have salt wasting but you may also have non classical forms in which they don't have salt wasting 17 hydroxylase deficiency will have hypertension and aromatase will have hyperandrogenism along with tall stature so four groups of disorders which will cause tall stature include estrogen receptor defect xy dst aromatase and all these scenarios you need to be wary about in terms of assessment and diagnosis in that regards so the key questions that a physician who is managing a child with primary amenorrhea has to answer is is it amenorrhea if it's amenorrhea it's structural or functional and what's the cause now amenorrhea is classically defined as low menarche within 5 years of onset of breast development or by 15 years of age you do not have you have to start evaluating and working so don't do unnecessary work up if it is not required in that perspective the next question is structural versus functional and for this you have to look at the breast and the pubic hair development so if all the components of pubertal development is there and you have amenorrhea you may have a structural defect rarely this may happen in the setting of somebody who was doing well then develops a acquired cause of gonadism so you may have a scenario in which somebody develops a brain tumor somebody develops hyperprolactinemia but usually you if you look at breast and pubic hair you will get the diagnosis so this scenario there is pubic hair development but there is no breast development it means there is a gnrh deficiency so you have no estrogen production no breast development but because adrenals are working this is gnrh deficiency the adrenarche is normal if you have no breast no pubic hair development this could be a constitutional delay of puberty in growth or it could be a illness or really a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency where also you can have a similar scenario if you have a normal breast development with sparse pubic hair you are usually dealing with androgen insensitivity syndrome and finally if you have a normal breast development normal pubic hair development and amenorrhea look for malformation and that becomes relevant from that perspective and these are very very important in that regards so if you want to differentiate now from a structural to a functional lesion in a girl who has got thylarchy and pubarchy with a normal estradiol it's usually a structural defect go for imaging go for other aspects in that perspective while if there is 
up thilarchy which is option pubarchy is variable you have to think whether there is a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in that regards now we know that this is a functional cause not a structural cause the next question is what is the cause so the key things to look at examination include hirsutism if you have a girl who had a normal breast development normal pubic hair development but has significant hirsutism think that this could be pcos we have seen so many pcos with primary amenorrhea as well so this is something to look at if however there is no hirsutism and no thilarchy it means there is a complete hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in this regards if they are tall think of a xy dsd or a estrogen receptor defect if they have a normal breast development in sparse pubic hair that is androgen insensitivity syndrome if there is salt wasting as discussed star hypertension 17 hydroxylase and aromatase again hyperandrogenism and tall stature which will be there so if you understand and look at the basic clinical parameters you will identify these causes so these are the various causes i have summarized we'll go into individual aspect which will help us reach the diagnosis so most important is that usually if somebody is not having periods you expect the breast to be not there but if there is a good breast development you are dealing with either androgen insensitivity or hyperandrogenism or structural defect easy to identify in that regards pubarchy if it's absent you are dealing with androgen insensitivity hypogonadotropic hypogonadism basically if it is a very severe growth problem especially because of a, a systemic illness or a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency hirsutism will indicate hyperandrogenism and aromatase will also be a part of that differential now very important that's what the focus today is height everybody who comes to you with delayed puberty should be short we say everybody with precocious puberty should be tall if you have a short girl think thyroid similarly here if you have delayed puberty with tall stature there is something wrong going on you have to think of androgen insensitivity usually you are thinking of a xy individual so ais will come there any other xy dsd will come there and aromatase and es1 so these are the four possible causes of tall stature with primary amenorrhea and we will be covering all four of them so this is just a hint as to what cases we are going to talk about today fsh usually will be high in most cases if you have a low fsh you are dealing with a central cause basically and of course estrogen will also give you a picture if your estrogen is high and you have amenorrhea your diagnosis is there of estrogen receptor resistance So, if you look at the breast development, the pubic hair development, the height, the hirsutism, FSH, you will get the diagnosis in most cases in that regards. And finally, to put it in perspective, if your breast development is not there, you are mostly dealing with the hypo or hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. FSH is high; you have to work up for further. Estradiol is low. Look for gonadal dysgenesis. Very important. Do a cardiotype. if estrogen is high you will think of estradiol resistance if you have got low fsh you are dealing basically with a case of uh, a problem of central cause go for mri <clears throat> and if you have on the other hand a normal breast development and you have got no pubic hair this is most likely androgen insensitivity go for karyotype if you have got good pubic hair development and hirsutism is there work up for hyperandrogenism no hirsutism look for structural defect so key message is no breast development no periods hypogonadotropic hypo or hypergonadotropic hypogonadism normal breast development without pubic hair it is androgen insensitivity normal breast and pubic hair with hirsutism pcos normal breast and pubic hair without hirsutism think of a structural defect so another case with a tall girl uh she presented to us with a uh, at a 7 year old and she was born of non consensuous marriage and she came with the complaints of uh, no breast development and no menstrual bleeding and there was no history of any delayed menarche in mother and the delayed shaving in father uh, no history of any chronic illness or poor appetite and uh, there was uh, no history of any vomiting headache or uh, delayed difficulty in vision no anosmia and uh, no history of any vitiligo and alopecia and uh, there was no history of any recurrent hospital admission and uh, recurrent illness 
and uh, there was no history of any recurrent the weight gain or the constipation and when we asked for the she gave that she has a, a surgery for abdominal mass when she consult uh, contacted her doctor she told us that uh, she that uh, mass was probably the germinoma so it's not moving forward This girl yeah. was presented basically with the renal puberty and apparently an abdominal surgery. So this on examination, her vitals were completely stable. Uh, BP, she was normotensive, no high blood no blood pressure was not high. And on anthropometry, we found that uh, her uh, height was uh, more, that was 164 centimeter, which was uh, more for the girls. And uh, on the general examination, uh, there was no any significant examination we found. Uh, on uh, this, uh, we found the breast stage was uh, one and there was no pubic hair. So the tennis stage was one at the 17 year of age. On the systemic examination was completely normal. We stop at that yeah. point. So you now have a girl who had presented to us with tall stature with primary amenorrhea and who has got a breast, which is no breast development and no pubic hair development, which is there. What do you think you're working at, looking at? What do you think is a problem Sir, here? If we look only the breast development and no pubic hair, then mm -hmm. our uh, DNA will be like uh, chronic illness of MPHD, but there is no history of any... No, so you have not seen no. there is no breast tall development no. Now coming no to pubic the... hair. With now, tall stature. Now coming to the tall stature and no pubic hair or no breast development. So uh, we should be thinking of uh, any this uh, steroidogenic defect like 17 beta HSD could be the cause. So we talked about the tall stature basically is associated with four things with primary amenorrhea. What are the four things? So one is the this uh, AIS, one is uh, XY gonadal dysgenesis, one is uh, aromatase deficiency, one is estrogen receptor resistance. Okay, so let's go one by one. Can it be AIS? No, sir, because, because the breast there is no breast development. So AIS is out. Can it be a estrogen receptor defect? No, sir. Why? Sir, because uh, this uh, there is uh, no pubarchy. No pubarchy. Aromatase again, no pubarchy. No so pubarchy. those three are out. So the only difference which is there to us is the XX DSD which is there. So that XX DSD could be a gonadal dysgenesis or it could be a steroidogenic defect. Steroid. Both of them can cause this scenario. So again, as we talked about all the four cases, tall stature gives you a big thing. And the other cases, the three cases did not have a breast development. Yes, the AIS one had a breast development. So again, if you look at breast and pubic hair and height, you will get the diagnosis. So why is pubic hair and height? Uh, so because X, of the uh, delayed bonage. So X X we are talking about X Y So in this completely gonad is gone and everything is delayed and that's why the adenarchy have also not pushed it to the picture. On um, looking into the investigations, uh, on a combined adeno testicular testicular biosynthetic uh, the USD shows the uterus was present and it showed the right ovary and the left was not visualized. In the biochemical investigations, the LH and FSH both were high and the estrogen and testosterone both were very low. So what does it mean? So the gonadal open levels are high and the, this, whether it is a test case or OV, both, it is not working. So got three cases. The first case was there in which you had got a high LH and FSH right. and estradiol levels were 50, 50 or 60. And testo was also high. That turned out to be an estrogen receptor resistant. problem. Then we had the second case in which estrogen was zero, and but testo was high, high, which means it was more like a aromatase deficiency. Then we have got this third case in which you have got zero testo, zero estrogen. Yes, what does it mean? So there is a gonadal failure. The so completely failure. the gonad is not working at all. And probably this gonad is not an ovary. Hmm. Because this can only happen that you're not having any androgen production because otherwise if the ovary is producing something then endosteine and dion will come up, some production will be there. So probably this is a test is which is completely non-functional 
not producing testosterone, of course, then estrogen is not being produced, and not producing AMH, which is causing the uterine development, which is there. So normal uterus is there. So this is the way to look. So if you look at the LH, E2, and testo of all four cases, you can easily understand that CAI is what was the scenario. In CS, the test was this AMH was high. That is, AMH the, was so very high. high. Testo was high. Testo was and high. Estrogen was high. Estrogen was high. So, in that case of a a AI, you had got a high LH, you high had got a normal FSH, FSH, and you got a high testo, FSH. high AMH, along with that, those scenario and estrogen. So, that was a different scenario mm -hmm. in which the gonads are not there in that perspective. Here, what you are seeing is that you don't have any production. Of test, so basically the gonad is not working okay. at all, and FSH is also very high. What does it mean when you say FSH is high? Means the inhibin is not being formed. Yes, so inhibin is also not working. So if you contrast this to the AIS, where LH was around twenty, it was not very high, and FSH was around two, no. so FSH was normal. So this means that there is no inhibin also. Yeah. So there is a bicellular testicular failure. This is what you can say from this report. So, if you talk about a biosynthetic defect, now can a biosynthetic defect present like this? So, in a biosynthetic defect, so there will be some adrenal problem, there will be electrolyte difference also. FSH, high FSH. FSH, high no, there will be LH. LH. Inhibit will be produced, produced in that scenario. So, biosynthetic defects also become unlike. So, this becomes like a classically a gonadal degeneration. Somewhere like a PUR and that kind of deficiency. Uh, POR and also in B, it will be produced, it will suppress FSH. So, in plus, they will have some endogenic features. Some features. So, this is like zero. Few incidents, though, she is a tall girl, so insulin is not working on the bone, there is no breast. That's why, working. that's why no P, no pubic head, no delays, head delayed bone age. But why is the adrenals not producing? Is the that's question the which we have to probably address later on as well. So, we have a girl with no secondary sexual characters. Uh, no, I mean, prim so primary menorrhea and the high FSH and low estrogen. estrogen. So, what could be the differentials now? It could be uh, Turner, no, because the height is more. In Turner's, the we got short stature. Steroidogenic defect, star SSC, we got salt wasting, 17 hydroxylase, we have hypertension. And aromatase, we have generally high androgen, as in this case, we have low testosterone. 17 beta HSD, there is no um, this puberty virilization as discussed earlier. Autoimmune, there is no history of any chronic, there is no history of any beta leco alopecia, so, it is less likely. Very early. Okay. Very early. early. Okay. So that means the ovary were damaged too early. Too early. Unlikely. Gonadal degenesis, yes, as Sir has discussed. It could be the possibility. So we have then we ordered karyotype, and when it came out, it was 46XY. So and now that history became important. important. So we got the history of it having German data. Later. They said there was some his abdominal surgery which was done. Yes, sir. So that history now becomes very significant. So we have a girl with um 46XY karyotype with uterus with null palpable gonads and with the female external genitalia. So in combining these, what could be the our next differentials? It could be, if we combine 46 XY and uterus, the possibility could be AMS deficiency and resistance. And if we combine 46 XY and female external genitalia, we, it could be AIS. But if we combine all these three, the possibility is, 46 XY with gonadal dysgenesis. So basically, the whole gonad is not working. It's not producing AML, it's not producing estrogen, it's not doing testosterone. Then we sent the genetic testing, and when it came out, it showed that the patient has a mutation in NUP uh, 107 gene, and uh, it does ovarian dysgenesis, and it shows uh, the likely pathogenesis in this case. Ovarian yes, sir. yes, this is a. I've seen this patient. Yeah, this is the similar patient. Uh, there is a this. Uh, so, what is this NUP? This is. Yes, huh. So, what is. Who brought up MRPH? Yeah, my similar patient with that. 
So this NUP107 is basically a nuclear pore complex gene. It interacts with the tissue fact the specific factors and it is required for the development maintenance of the gonads. And during the meiosis one, in response to the DNA damage, it binds with APF1 and mediates cell cycle arrest. So when there is a mutation in NUP107, the meiosis DNA damage response decreases and it leads to the oocyte death. This is the basic physiology that the NUP07 does. So, but in our case, this. Uh, so, I think this, this is a big dilemma. Yes, we sir. have an XY individual and we have got a gene which is affecting the O side. So, whether there is a double hit model, something else caused this to develop like a female ovaries developed and then those ovaries were damaged, we are not very sure about that. Can you think of anything? That's um, uh, the similar. We, we... It might act at the level of germ cells. So it probably is at a very pre. So because they have done, this might be a new kind of a diagnosis. So they have only found it in people who were. Um, so we have to see whether it like also has a testicular. Have so we should report this because it's so a very interesting. So this um, is Actually, if it is acting on the germ cells. So, and uh, we it's have so. Death, it can cause uh, germ cell death in the testes also. Not only germ cell, we are talking about death of the Leydig cell yes. and the Sertoli cell also. So, this but is a bit different. Germs are not there, which cause. They can survive. They can survive. Uh, in pure the natural. In, 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 in testes, they can work that. So, if even if you have got zero sperms, you can have Leydig cells which are functioning. So, it's a bit no, different. No, that's Thing. It was from, so right from the time of differentiation of the germ cells. Hmm. So when the germ cells in embryogenic period are traveling to the area, this because of the Y chromosomes, they uh, stimulate the development of the leading cells and the thyroid cells. So I'm not saying uh, acquired kind of a defect where the leading cells are protected here because it's an interactive. So at the level of so maybe, it is, maybe like, something new. So it we have to definitely be. inquire into that because the thing we were thinking of, it's mainly affecting meiosis. So if it affects meiosis, it, it is the germ cell. in females. But in males, the meiosis happens at a very late stage. In oocyte, the meiosis happens at an early stage. Testicular sperm meiosis happens only in puberty. So it is not fitting it, but definitely it has to be something which is some mechanism it is working separately. So not also. this mechanism. So not this mm -hmm. mechanism. But this is a very, very interesting scenario. And that's why we brought up because this is an individual who is tall, who has got no breast development, no pubic hair development, who has developed a germinoma. So there is a gonadal not, not, not this one. And she had already developed a germinoma. So there is a gonadal dysgenesis which is there definitely. So we have to remove the gonads and all those things are there as the second gonad also has to be removed. But we have not reached the root cause of the testicular. So whether how this can explain is a question. You can just explain a few yeah. studies. Uh, did you make picture of that patient? Uh, which uh, uh, this patient? She'll come and, and I'll take the picture. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, there are some because case. She had a little bit. She's the same Muslim patient. Ha, ma'am. She's the head. one. I'll so bring you. Know, Masculine yes, ma'am. She's yeah. She's broad. She has so broad shoulders. Her muscular. Uh, so that's why we did the testing. She had a little bit of trichotomy also. So maybe this happened um somewhere in the middle of you know say from the seventh week onwards when the test will have been differentiated mm -hmm. and then the hit happened and the other thing which we cannot explain is that why is there no pubarchy because and the females are there so, so whether the female are also head. having some androgen production is also being disrupted somehow somewhere so in this, the this the seems to be looking for you hmm. so you showed about the research yeah uh, there were uh, this uh, uh, study was done and uh, they studied two daughters in the same family and they have, they have reported this uh, NUP107 in these two sisters and uh, what and they have studied the same variant in the mice and what they have seen that there was a, a subfertility in the female mice but the uh, this male mice was normal the testes of male mice was normal and this so only with NUP107 and uh, the similar study was done uh, in the drosophila also, which also showed this. The eggs of the drosophila females were affected, but the testes of the male drosophila was normal. This was shown in this. Uh, 
So this is the so this is very important the yeah. effects at a later stage. Yeah. So that, that is, but there are some other effects, or there are some other gene which has been missed out. So everybody, every every human will have 20 to 30 genes which will cause a disease in somebody else, and they may not cause. Suppose there is a male. If the male has got this gene defect, he doesn't have any effect on him. But there may be some other genes which we may, we may not have picked up because yeah. we are doing a clinical exome sequencing, not the whole exome sequencing. Yeah. So that will be the way forward to go for the whole exome. But this is a very, very interesting scenario which you have mentioned in that regard. Yeah. 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 Hmm. But she has something else which we have to found out. Yeah. So, I, so anyhow, this was a very, very interesting case. So we have had four cases which we discussed today. All four were tall. And along with tall stature, they had got issues in terms of primary amenorrhea. The first case basically had an issue in terms of tall stature along with uh, there were problems of estrogen which was detectable. There were normal pubic hair development. So estrogen was around 50. So you had high estrogen. And along with that, you had primary amenorrhea turn out to be an estrogen sensing receptor defect. The second case was a girl who was born with atypical genitalia. Then from there, move forward towards primary amenorrhea. So androgen excess to estrogen deficiency turn out to be aromatase deficiency. The third case labeled quote unquote as MRKH actually presented with tall stature with normal breast development and sparse pubic hair. And then was found to have an AIS. And if you look at those pathophysiological picture of a slightly high LH, normal FSH, high testo, high estrogen. That is a typical uh, biochemical picture of AIS. And finally, this case, a tall girl, again, no breast, no pubic hair and masculine habitus also was suggested a XY, history of germinoma. And clearly, you had got no AMH. You had got no estrogen, you had got no testosterone. And you have a strange uh, uh, gene defect which is causing, which cannot really explain. So this is something which is very interesting. So we show that if you have a tall girl with amenorrhea, there are only four things which you should widely consider. Estrogen receptor problem, aromatase deficiency, XYDSD, which includes AIS and all those phenomena, and the gonadogenesis, which is there from that perspective. So just to summarize, this is a typical case of a primary amenorrhea, good breast development, good pubic hair development, reasonable height, everything is normal. So we are basically dealing here more with a structural defect. So we have developed a, a part of our pathway which helps you reach the diagnosis based upon the algorithm.